Warning. Listening to this show may result in increased levels of inspiration, motivation, and innovation. Side effects can include the immediate urge to take massive action to build a better business and life for yourself and others. You've been warned. Welcome to Influencers Radio with your host, Jack Mize. And welcome back to another episode of Influencers Radio. And today, uh, my guest is, I think, a, a true definition of an influencer. And the uh, story of how he got to where he is is fascinating. Um, but to me, the really fascinating part is how he is changing the scope and the role of an educator these days, and not just an ed- educator, but specifically in the world of special education, but also in the world of entrepreneurial education for what is called Generation Z. And we'll get into that because today, my guest, he has built a successful career in corporate America. Uh, he managed sales teams for several Fortune 500 companies and uh, was consulting as a training and developing manager for these companies. But last year, he followed a lifelong personal goal to leave the boardroom and move his skill set to the classroom. And in that short time, he as quickly as emerged as one of the most highly sought after special education uh, teachers and Generation Z teen coaches. Uh, he's a guest contributor for CNN iReport, writing on the topic of education and entrepreneurship. And he is here uh, with me today to share a little of his story about how he is influencing and shaping that Generation Z in the public school system, which I know is a big, big uh, interest and issue for a lot of people, including myself. So let me welcome to Influencers Radio, Mr. Chad Collins. Welcome to Influencers Radio, Chad. Hey, Jack. Thanks so much for having me here today, and I'm excited to uh, get this going. Well, you know, it's... We see things every single day uh, on the news, in the paper, in magazines, throughout media about the state of education and what's wrong with education. And then I also, because I have uh, teenagers in high school, I hear from the teacher side and how restricted uh, things can be and how careful uh, they have to be. And it really seems like it's a kind of a, a pressure cooker that keeps getting uh, uh, hotter and hotter. But what you've come in, you, you are not just an educator, but you're also an advocate for the success of what's called Generation Z students, not just in the classroom, I guess, but but also um, in life. So let's talk about that. Uh, and then we also want to get into your your uh, special education programs and what you're doing there as well. But first of all, let's define Generation Z. Perfect. Generation Z is basically what we have right now. Every student that's in grade K through 12, it's P- uh, children born between 1995 and, and present date. So that is our, our Generation Z, which comes after my generation, the millennials, Gen Y. Well, somebody's screwing up because we're running out of letters, right? <laughs> I, I don't know what's going to become next. Maybe ABC. Yeah, because we had the baby boomers, and uh, the, yeah, I can't even keep up with all the ones that they, they uh, called them. So right now, Generation Z is the, those kids that are pretty much in school, from grade school all the way to uh, – uh, to high school, and that's pretty much who you're 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 focused on uh, working with. And you aren't that far off. You're in the you're the millennial generation. Define that one so we we have a framework of that too. Uh, basically, uh, the millennial generation. I'm at the the beginning end of it. Uh, so I'm 33 years old, and uh, I believe it started in 1980 or 1981, uh, and went up to uh, basically right before 1995. Uh, when we, we switched over from, from Gen Y to Gen Z. All right. And so you were in that generation that kind of began with that, I, I don't know, that greed error. That was the, the, the error that, you know, we started seeing the Wall Street and the Gordon Geckos and greed is good and, and the, um, you know, even movies of that time, there was a lot of, I guess, what people would call aspiration or people that were eager for for wealth and even uh, conspicuous wealth. And 
So you grew up in that, and you actually went into corporate America, uh, working for Fortune 500 companies. But one of the things that really struck me was the fact that before you even jumped into that world, you already knew that your exit plan was to become a teacher. And that really is kind of a, I don't want to say it's a, it's a, it's a odd leap, but it's probably not a, a one that people plan on. There's a lot of people that leave corporate world and go into teaching because of, 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 of circumstances or when it's time to slow down or retire, but you made a very conscious decision that you are going to become an educator uh, at a very early age and make that transition. Talk about how you made that decision and, and what was the catalyst for that. Yeah, so I like to think of it as, uh, as I always called it, my retirement from business. Uh, maybe not a financial retirement, but I was going to leave wherever I was at in business, uh, no matter how far up the corporate ladder I had climbed or you know different types of businesses that I had ran, that I would go into education. And where that came from is my family, uh, a good portion of them are either educators or they've been very successful in business or had their own businesses themselves. So I grew up in that culture of being around educators and being around business. And when I was in high school, uh, going through playing multiple different sports, um, you know, I, the pressures that I ran into were, were immense, uh, much like the pressures kids face today. But I was fortunate enough to have different coaches and mentors that were in my life kind of give me guidance. So I, I had the initial understanding of what it meant for somebody to be an advocate for me and, and my success in life, not going down the wrong path. So I knew then that, you know, obviously everyone was talking about, let's go to college. You're going to get a good job after college. You know, so that was kind of the route that I wanted to go. And obviously I was attracted to money in, in high school, which having the business background in my family, I could see myself doing very well in that. But I also wanted to be an educator and give back like people had invested into me during those developmental years of you know elementary school, junior high, and, and high school. So I had that framework already kind of worked out, and I had picked a random number that was 35. I thought that would give me enough time out in, in corporate America to, to do whatever it was that I was going to do after I'd gone, gone through college. Uh, so I continued down that path, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not 35 yet, but through a unique series of events, uh, kind of one of those things that hits you when you're not looking. Uh, my long story, but I'll make it short. My sister is a police officer in a suburb outside of Denver, and she was on patrol one night. Uh, so this is my younger sister, and and she had got shot on a welfare check and sustained very life-threatening injuries. Um, and and fortunately, she she is still with us today, and and you know looking forward to aspirations of a full recovery. Uh, still going through that process. But that phone call that I received that night about a year and a half ago was one of those that just puts things in perspective that life is short. And I realized right then that I could not continue doing what I was doing, that my greater calling to impact and influence and make a difference in people's lives was basically my ultimate purpose and calling in life that I had to pursue. It made it so that I couldn't even think about going to my job another day uh, and doing things that ultimately, in perspective of realizing how precious life is, just seem mundane and, and not quite as impactful or, or meaningful uh, to the greater good. So at that point, I committed. I said, you know what? Forget the 35 plan. We're, we're updating it. And fortunately, I've been successful enough to have built up a nest egg where I could you know, go from making six figures and work in the boardroom to ultimately not making quite as much, but transitioning to working on my alternative credentials and taking my skill set to the classroom and working in special ed. And where that came from, I've grown up around special needs students since uh, really as long back as I could remember. As I mentioned, uh, family members were, were very active in entrepreneur businesses and active in the community. So one of the things that I grew up doing was the regional special Olympics. So from uh, probably as early as five, every year, uh, my family and I would be volunteers cheering and coaching and encouraging on, you know, track athletes during the Special Olympics and our regional events in California. So I've just grown up with the heart and the passion for, you know, that population skill set. And my mom herself is a resource teacher. And so I got to see growing up just the impact 
that a teacher can have, especially a special education teacher, in these students' lives who people have written off, who have you know more challenges than not, and just ultimately face an uphill battle. But with the right educator and the right advocate for their success, not only are they going to succeed in school, they're also going to su- succeed in life. And I've been fortunate enough to have been able to witness that and kind of have that shape my educator mindset. And that's what's brought us here today. Well, I think, you know, not only are you fortunate for that to happen, but there's a lot of uh, kids out there that are fortunate for you to have uh, experienced that. And uh, was special education something that you knew uh, all along that that's what you would enter to, uh, into? Uh, because you made this decision uh, early on that you were going to uh, transfer from corporate life to uh, the uh, education by the time you were 35, did you already have your sights on special education, or is that something that kind of evolved or, or unfolded along the way? Yeah, my heart's always broken for, for special needs students, and just having grown up around them, uh, I, I knew that's where I was going to go into. Um, and then also coaching um, students um, you know, through sports or whatnot would be you know, the other side of it, the gen ed students that I'd get an opportunity to work with through that too. But yeah, I always knew that special education would be the kind of the field that I'd go into. I, I almost appreciate the challenge. And, and so you also are working with, with the, 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 uh, um, the generation Z students, uh, that on the entrepreneurial side, and I want to get into that, um, as well, knowing that you were going to be moving into the education realm, you know, most, um, and, and I, Hesitate to say most because I don't have accurate figures on there, but it seems to be, you know, through uh, being around my kids' school that a lot of the teachers, they're career teachers. That's what they went to college for is to be teachers, and that's uh, where they landed, and that's where they built their their career path. But you having the the, uh, benefit of working in corporate America, along the way, did you stop and see situations and think, ah, you know, this is going to be something really good that I need to kind of tuck away and remember this as a lesson that I can use when I move into uh, education. I bet this would work really well uh, for kids to help them understand. Were there things that you kind of purposely picked up on through your corporate life that you knew that you were going to take into the classroom? You know, it's really a coin flip toss. Um, In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. And I'll frame that with, it was really tough. Uh, Granted, my circumstances were what they were uh, with my sister having been shot, but you know, I can't say that when, you know, two years later when I was 35, uh, you know, with all the trimmings and trappings of success, you know, the house, the cars, you know, the fun, and, and all while raising a family, you know, I don't know that I would have had to push myself to make the commitment right then and there to leave everything and go into teaching. So I can't say that all along I was tucking little nuggets away, but I did realize that basically the same thing that I had been doing in corporate America Uh, with training and developing employees and coaching them uh, for their success in sales and managing these teams is more or less what you do as a teacher between classroom management and educating the students. Um, And the unique aspect of it, what I had done is I didn't realize this, but I had actually been teaching my whole life. That's actually something that I was doing in corporate America. And so the skill set could follow. You just interchangeable parts more or less and just trading you know, sales management philosophies for, you know, textbook philosophies, um, but still working with the individuals. And that's one aspect that it, that special education does really tap into is you're actually working with an individual who you understand that they have differences in learning, differences in background, and they need a tailored plan to be successful in school. So it's maybe not a blanket one-size-fits-all education but you're actually able to dovetail into specifically what's going to help this individual to be the most successful for the immediate needs as well as their future needs. And that plays in perfectly to everything that I'd already been doing uh, in transforming sales teams from underperforming to, you know, getting them to exceed expectations. Um, So I, I actually find myself drawing a lot on my own life experience and that's what I've really been able to incorporate into the curriculum of which I teach is to make it practical and relevant to their life nowadays. So I'm drawing upon a lot of stories and things that I've seen 
and using those as examples to say, hey, here's what you're going to encounter. You may not know how to do a, a trigonomic calculation or whatnot necessarily later in life, but here's where something like that might be relevant and get in and kind of just to, you know, look at a globe and then you just spin it just a little bit and you change that perspective in their minds and it really helps them to understand better rather than, you know, a blanket one size fits all approach to education where this is what it is, this is how you have to learn it, and, you know, a lot gets lost in translation. Well, yeah, it certainly does. And I think one of the things that, you know, I'm realizing as as I, I, I listen to you is that uh, it really is it, everything from the corporate side of it to uh, the school side of it. It really is getting the most out of people, getting them to uh, hit their potential in, in what they can do. And a lot of times that requires someone, whether it be a teacher, whether it be a trainer, um, whether it be a, it's almost like a, a coach, which, uh, interestingly enough, is, is something that you also have that moniker of coach. We all know that working in the classroom, and I'm, I imagine that uh, in the special education uh, area, it's probably doubly so or more, it, very tight restrictions on the parameters that what you can and can't uh, do as far as a teacher, but you've taken things beyond the uh, classroom day of the curriculum where a lot of folks may, you know, days over, I'm done, I'm going home. You've created outside of the classroom uh, programs for students to be able to uh, take advantage of your, your boardroom, your, your, your business uh, um, experience and I guess what I see it happening, what I, why I truly feel that you're an influencer, is you're letting them be able to get experiences that most would never be able to get until they were outside of college even. Uh, and, and not just great experience, but, you know, the bruises and the bumps that come along. Talk about your programs around entrepreneurship that you um, are working and coaching with uh, kids on that uh, prepare them, I think, you know, probably more than just about any other programs I've seen for the, the life after education. Yeah, well, well, thank you. And, and absolutely, I was invited to pick a topic, any topic, that I wanted to teach an after-school academy on to students. Um, that would it'd be like an elective, like they could choose from, you know, what other people were going to be teaching on. And, you know, I, I, I knew right then and there – Hands down, I wanted to do something about entrepreneurship because Generation Z is the most entrepreneurial generation that we're going to have. They've grown up around the Internet. They've been connected digitally to everything. They, I mean, they don't know a life without multiple screens. And they are so well connected. And, I mean, I mean really, they're, they're taking things to a whole other level, you know, on the consumerism side. But, you know, one thing, and, and this is where there's a gap in the public education system, is – that there is not the word entrepreneurship or entrepreneur. Really, oftentimes, they're not going to hear about that until college. And for many, it's not even an extracurricular option. So when this extracurricular activity came up, I knew right then and there that I was going to start introducing students to the word entrepreneur and what it meant to run a small business. I couldn't think of any other better way than to do that at the elementary school level than to teach them how to run a lemonade stand. So my after-school academy is all about and I titled it, if you wanted to make $500 plus, 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 plus dollars this summer running your own business, here's how you could do it using a lemonade stand model. And for many, you know, they're, since they're not going to get that until college most often, this is a great introduction to it. And there was a great turnout signed up for the academy. People were turned away. Uh, we only had room for an enrollment of 10. But I've been asked back to do a second session of it uh, in the spring semester as well. Well, I can see a class like that they're enrolling hundreds in the thousands uh, when people get uh, to really understand that. Because, you know, when I was growing up, I, I don't even know if the word entrepreneur existed. It, it was, you know, something, it was someone that, uh, you know, owned their own business or, uh, you know, someone that worked for themselves. Uh, some people even would look at you as just being an unemployed bum if you didn't work for the corporate, you know, uh, uh, world. Yeah. And, and so there was no uh, term of entrepreneur. But I think everyone that is listening to this right now understands that lemonade stand 
concept and not just the the mechanics of running a lemonade stand but the romanticized vision that every kid ever had about running a lemonade stand that went along with it and i can see where that attraction is and i can also see where it's just probably an incredible um you know environment to to teach these lessons because every kid thinks about putting on that paper cap and and you know s- s- selling the lemonade. So what are the age groups again that that you work with in in for this lemonade academy? Yeah, the after school academy is for third, fourth, and fifth grade elementary students. And so, and like you said, I you know my son is in high school. He has an entrepreneur uh, a class that you know that a big part of their curriculum is watching Shark Tank. I think. Uh, I've I've seen entrepreneur uh, programs in colleges, and you know one of the the ironies of it are that the people teaching it may never have actually been in that entrepreneurial uh, situation, or even in the business world. And you coming from the corporate world and working with people that are out there, you know, uh, fighting for their next check and and doing the things that uh, needs to be done is probably has a tremendous impact on these kids. When you teach this, this uh, program, how much of it do you let them get the bruises? How many do you let them see that the potential failures are the things that aren't always going to go exactly as they should? Yeah, that's one of those tough life lessons is learning how to, how to fail. Um, Cause you know, they, they've grown up being told that they're great at everything and they can do whatever they want. So when, they do fail at something. It's it's kind of shock and awe. Uh, and in fact, you know, I've had conversations with hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of you know business owners and entrepreneurs. And and one thing that's repeatedly been a theme that they've always shared is that they they've made mistakes in their business and they wish they had learned at a younger age those business lessons. That way, you know, where they're at today would be exponentially further along because they would have learned so young what it was like to fail or what it was like to make a mistake in this. And then when they did hit full stride in the workforce or, you know, after high school or after college, then you know, they'd be much further along in you know, the business acumen and, and just their skill set in general. And that's one of those things that I took into this and said, well, great, I get them at a third, fourth, and fifth grade level. Their, their little minds are just starting to get formed, and I have a, a chance to impart not only wisdom, but, you know, the skills that really are going to, you know, teach them self-confidence and motivation and, and really give them a grit, you know, that kind of things that will carry them through life and give them social and emotional skills that they're going to learn through running a business. And they're going to, uh, you know, go through a nine week course curriculum that covers everything from planning and budgeting to advertising and branding, supply and demand, customer satisfaction. And it does, it ties into all the school curriculum too. I mean, there's English language arts reading, there's mathematics, social studies, and science, and fine arts. So they're really getting a, a full, practical application of education, uh, which is really outside the box thinking for you know today's public school system. Oh, yeah, well, beyond outside the box thinking, and I think it's remarkable that you um, were able to put this together and 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 put it together with a perspective um, that you have. One of the things that I love is the way that you frame that is that you provide opportunities to fail because the fact is they're going to hit those at some point or another and and to be prepared for them um, is, you know, obviously a a huge benefit. And to do this in a day and an age when it seems that we are so careful with kids, so careful not to, not just to keep them from being hurt physically, but so careful to not hurt their, their feelings. And even, you know, where, you see sports leagues going as far as well we don't we don't keep score because we don't want a winner or a loser and and to me that that kind of uh protection may be more damaging in long term uh than it is in the in the short term and it seems like what you're able to do with these opportunities to fail not that you make them fail but give them the opportunity to fail is it's almost like you're inoculating them and preparing them for those those failures in the future. Do you see the kids uh, that is preparing them to be able to handle um, these type of challenges and failures? Because they say that, that, you know, the person is, it's, it's really, you find out who the person is not, you know, when they are winning, it's when they are losing and how they react to those situations that really uh, uh, reveals their character. Uh, have you seen kids that, uh, 
and have been surprised by the way that they've reacted when things don't go the way that they think they 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 should. Yeah, more or less at this age, I mean, they are they're like rubber bands; they bounce back. Um, you know, one thing that that I think is kind of cool, and, and if you structure failure in a in a in a way that makes it fun and educational, and it's not judgmental and threatening uh, or personal, it, it opens up the playing field to to learn how to handle that appropriately. Uh, you know, for example, what I'm organizing right now is uh, where they're going to have a pitch contest, kind of like a mini Shark Tank where the kids will pitch a group of teachers and uh, hopefully bring in some outside business people who are willing to invest the startup capital necessary that, to purchase their lemonade stand supplies. You know, like going out buying lemons and, and sugar and, you know, cups and ice chest and ice and things like that. So when I had first surveyed, you know, this network of entrepreneurs that I'm connected to and see what their idea was about this, you know, they loved it. They, they all wish they had something like this. Uh, when they were young, but as they get out there and, and they go through this process, you know, they may learn that location, location, location is everything. And if they didn't pick the right location, they're not going to maybe make as much as, you know, one of their, one of their friends or competitors, you know, but we're framing it as friends. So they're going to learn to fail if they do fail in a way that failing doesn't feel like failing. Failing feels like a learning opportunity. And, and that's where my job really too, as an advocate and a coach is to coach them through that. What does it look like? Is it okay? How do we overcome that? How do we bounce back? What can we take from this? And how can we improve it for next time? And it's putting that framework into it where, you know, so much emphasis is placed on, uh, let's use math for an example, where there's a step-by-step process. You have to come out with the right answer at the end, or it's just flat out wrong. Well, in business, some things aren't flat out wrong. They're just opportunities to do something differently. Well, that's yeah, and I think to, to to see that perspective is is what what an opportunity that these kids have, and how fortunate they are to be able to work with you on this. Here's one thing I have to ask because having kids of my own, and you you kind of are in that age group that has probably seen more change than just about any other age group. Technology has has advanced so rapidly. I have kids that are in high school now, and I could remember when they first went into, you know, preschool and then into first grade where technology was available to them in high school now where technology is mandatory, right? You not I went from it's available to well you can use it if you have it to you must use this all right and so the change has been so uh so so rapid what do you see the difference because when i was in school there was none of this stuff kids today are so connected to technology so connected to uh the internet and how much of that do you use or deal with or or touch on in uh, these coaching and and entrepreneurial um, uh, programs uh, it, well, in the entrepreneurial programs, quite a bit. In the school setting, it's a it can be a good and a bad thing. And here's where I say that: you know, students, if they are on their devices at school, yes, they can use it to check social media. They can get off task. It, it can lead to cheating. Uh, so there are some some negative connotations with technology in the in the school system. But you know, can it be a new medium for teaching that's relevant and help them learn in ways that they best receive information? Absolutely. And I think there's a slow adoption rate uh, of teachers and educators to implement technology. It's almost like the generation of teachers are, a, there's, a, there's a gap, they're behind. They haven't grown up on the devices and the multiple different devices. Generation Z's minds are created to go for multitasking with games and they expect their you know, virtual world to be their reality world and they can, you know, just, you know, take in thousands of different images and they want content fed to them that way. But in the school setting, more often than not, they're getting it still through a textbook. And, you know, oftentimes you hear the phrase, man, this is boring. This is mundane. You know, I don't enjoy this. It's because we're not feeding them the right way that they want to be fed. So we have to adopt and adapt and yes, I'm part of the generation that is, is more adapted to that, but I see also the value in that. And, and these teams, they're, they're, they're connected globally. So not only that, they have unique opportunities to interact with 
people that are peers their own age in different countries who might be doing, you know, things differently over there. And so there's really an untapped and completely unique opportunity that I see that we have as educators to really provide the best education for our students. Not only that, but the skill sets that they're going to need in the future when they enter the workforce are not the skill sets that I might have necessarily needed or the generation before me with my family. It's going to be completely different. In fact, for elementary school students today, 65% of the jobs that they will go into after high school do not exist yet. So this is an uncreated market. They're, there's not a position. They don't know. They're going to oftentimes be creating them because over 70% of them in the junior high level want to own their own businesses. And 65% of high schoolers say they want to be entrepreneurs and run their own business too. So using that internet and using the connectedness has its huge advantages. And I try to implement as much of this into the classroom and into teaching as I can. Uh, you know, when I teach math, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of if you need to use a calculator to be successful with this, that's okay. I don't want you to not know how to use a calculator because, you know, I use a calculator. I don't sit there and solve problems doing, you know, 20-step things. That's not real life. Um, so, you know, to some that might be deemed a shortcut, and a lot of educators would see that as a shortcut. But to me, looking at it from the scope and the mindset of the students, all I'm going to advocate for them and say, that's a good shortcut. You know, the, they're used to creating hacks and, and cheats for things in games, and it's rewarded there. And in, in life, I mean, you can do things the slow way and wait to get results, or, you know, there might be a fast way to leapfrog everything and, you know, get in front of a trend, and that's, that's a shortcut, and that's a good thing. So there's, there's the two sides to it, and, you know, I have to, to wear the white gloves and, and walk finally on that, on that white line. But, uh, you know, my hope is that I can be the educator but also the advocate for the students and blend the two together so that way they have every possible advantage as well, they yeah. prepare for life. I mean, I think that that is true because, you know, hacks are part of – life you know shortcuts are part of life uh you know in school i guess it's called cheating in the real world it's called efficiency right <laughs> and yes, that's, that's what they say and and so it, it it is a fine line that you have to walk and i think you do it so well and 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 you know i i to, to me i can't imagine it five years ten years maybe even shorter that there being a, a curriculum and or systems based around the things that you are teaching because what you're doing isn't just you're not just kind of letting things happen or unfold you have a very purposeful way that you do this um, and one of the things i want to make sure that we get into is what you call your 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 five education avatars because i think when you talk about that and you break it down it shows how purposeful you put this together and how uh, you're able to do, I think, uh, you know, assessments or see how to get the most out of, of uh, these kids and actually help them reach their potential probably quicker than someone that's just, you know, let's see what happens kind of uh, program. So can you talk about that, the, those uh, education avatars? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so when I was going uh, this past year uh, prior to this school year, uh, I was working on my alternative credentials, you know, while working at a school. Um, like I said, I went from, you know, six figures down to, to not that much. Um, so while I was doing this, I had to supplement my income. And so what I used was I basically used the technology platform of the Internet to start a coaching program for Generation Z teen guys. And while I was putting this program together, um, more or less I came up with five different educator or coach avatars, uh, the first one being an advocate for the success of the student. So advocate would be one. And then the second level of that would be a chaplain of change. And the goal there is to get momentum headed in an improvement direction while removing the fear attached to it, to be that promoter of change. So once they've got that momentum, then they're going to hit a wall eventually, and they need what I call the third avatar, the breakthrough coach. And the goal here is to provide the mindset that they can shift the drift while the momentum slows. And then they're going to need somebody, which is the fourth avatar, who is a mentor. And the goal of that is, for me personally, where you live out the execution of all of the above, you know, being an advocate, being a chaplain of change, being a breakthrough coach, to really help 
guide them uh, through life. And then that allows the fifth avatar, which is a catalyst of clarity. And only then uh, the clarity of everything that they've been able to glean so far will shine so bright for the students, you know, through the students' lives to make a difference in their immediate as well as their future needs. So we've got advocate, chaplain of change, being a breakthrough coach, being a mentor, and being the catalyst of clarity for the success. You know, and <laughs> there has to be a lot of thought that's put into uh, to that, to, to, to recognize each of these, uh, stages. So one of the, the, the ones that was kind of interesting was stage two, when you talk about that uh, chaplet of change, uh, and removing the fear attached to change. It seems like the generation today is far more, um, I guess, a, a, adjusted to change than my generation, perhaps even your generation, where we didn't like change. You know, change, why can't things be the way that they, they are? Why do we have to keep changing? People get comfortable in change. But it's almost like this generation is, it's the, the default. Things will change, and they'll change rapidly. Have you seen um, uh, that characteristic in the kids that you work with, that change uh, doesn't seem to be such an abrasive uh, occurrence as it was for generations before? Yeah, absolutely. I think they're they're so used to change. In fact, almost too used to change. Um, you know, for example, Gen Z, they're, they're not brand loyal. They they mix and match everything now, from clothes to different brand philosophies. Um, so they're you know the the way the old way is out, and there's there's this new way that people are are, are quickly trying trying to adjust to. Um, you know, just from everything of how they how they feed into content, they're they're so multitasking and image driven that, you know, the, yeah, the, the, they, they understand change quite well, almost too well that people can't adjust quickly enough to, to really understand it. So really where, where I see myself in that is, you know, kind of the bridge between, uh, as the old phrase goes, you know, a formal education will earn you a living while self-education will make you a fortune. Um, I, I like to bridge those two as a as a hybrid together. In my role uh, as a teacher and educator, but I help them to as they do encounter change, they can roll with it really well. And you know, first they awaken to whatever it is that that involves the change, and then you have to activate something inside of them to to take action on it. And once you know, that's where we're teaching to the individual. You're going to know the student. You're going to be able to figure out what it is that motivates them. What you know, what's going to activate them to change? What's going to activate them to take action? And then, since you already know them, you can help work with them to learn how to apply it, and, you know, to to do the work. Um, and so that's really a, a kind of a, a beautiful, perfect storm as it comes together. Well, I think you said it all with the you know formal education earns your living, self education earns you a fortune, and to be able to have that bridge is is. Uh, is just a you know a tremendous opportunity. Chad Collins is one person. I know you you know with the success that you've seen at this, uh, I can't imagine that this can't be something that people would not want and and almost demand once they understood that it existed. Do you see any opportunities or plans to to duplicate this or to 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 be able to grow this with the demand once people find out about? kind of what you're doing and how you're uh, putting these programs together. Yeah, there, there's, yeah, it's an untapped uh, infancy stage right now. It, it can really grow and it can really change a lot of students' lives for the best. Now I've been asked multiple times with my experience and my background, if I want to go into administration uh, and go on the principal path. And, you know, I, I swore when I got out of management that I wouldn't go into management like that. And it's been tough to turn off that cap. And, uh, you know, when I see different inefficiencies and I have, you know, a million different ideas of things we could implement, uh, but to focus here. But right now, Jack, I'm under the belief uh, that if you can change one student's life, that student will impact more people than I could, than I personally could reach out to. So they say that the average student, a uh, high school student is going to impact uh, 100 people, you know, so if they impact them positively, that's, that's great. And if each one of those 100 people then goes out and impacts somebody else, I mean, we're, we're reaching thousands of people. So, yes, I am one person, but I truly believe that as I connect with these students 
and, and help them, you know, with their personal expansion in life and in the classroom, that they're going to go out and share what they're learning and they're going to be able to, to be the change that I want to see in others and it catch like wildfire and just spread. So I believe the impact that one educator can have and have completely unforeseen and huge numbers to the masses later in life. So it's kind of a long-term plan, but, but I don't see myself going into administration because my heart, my passion is in the individual and that relationship with them. Um, I could easily put a program together and train and make this, uh, it's a very duplicatable process, but at the same time, you have to have the right person in the right place. And it's tough to find an educator like myself. They're far and few between. Um, so as I come across people that are like-minded with myself, I would be more than happy uh, to share kindred spirits with them and, and help them want something if they want to do that and share these insights. And, and hopefully we can expand and, and get this everywhere. Well, that is a true definition of an influencer to be able to impact the people that you're impacting directly and know that that's going to go off and touch hundreds and even thousands of more people uh, throughout their lives. Just a, you know, remarkable stuff. Uh, how can folks find out more about Chad Collins, about, you know, keep up with, with what you're doing, keep up with your philosophies and, and the programs that you're, you're putting together? Yeah, perfect. I, the best way to catch me is uh, on Facebook, social media. That's one thing Generation Z loves, uh, every which way of social media. And so that's the best way to catch me, facebook.com backslash Chad Collins, C-M-O. Fantastic. Chad, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing this today and, and giving me the opportunity to be able to share this uh, with folks as well. Hey, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, and I hope the listeners were able to get something good out of it. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Folks, there you have it. Check out Chad Collins on uh, Facebook, uh, facebook.com, Chad Collins CMO. Until next time on Influencers Radio, remember, you are the only real game changer. You've been listening to Influencers Radio. To get all past shows and updates on future shows, visit InfluencersRadio.com today. Or follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Influencers Radio.